under the Controlled Substances Act and Corollary State Law, the growth, trafficking, sale, possession, or consumption of psychedelics may be a felony punishable by imprisonment, fines, forfeiture of property, or some combination thereof. Psychedelic X is for general information only. Information provided on the show does not constitute legal advice, nor does your listening to the show create an attorney-client relationship with the host. Hello, I'm attorney Gary Smith, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics, my ongoing exploration of the question of the law of psychedelics. Anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about you. Thanks for coming on the show, Anna. Well, no, thank you for having me. Anytime that I can get together with another like-minded person to talk about mushrooms and psychedelics and just beautiful experiences with plant medicine is always it's a gift. I'm so I'm grateful that especially like we can freely kind of talk about this now. And yeah, so it's part of our what part of our wellness regime now in our society, it's becoming kind of normalized. So Mm -hmm. yeah, Uh, that's part of what I'm after here is to get people comfortable talking about this. But tell you what, before we dive in, let's get you properly introduced because I'm willing to bet at least some portion of my audience has no idea who you are, Anna. Well, nobody knows who I am. (laughs) Well, do we want to keep it that way? We could use a pseudonym today. (laughs) No, it's fine. I'll just call you Bob. (laughs) All right. So um, I I actually know you by two last names. I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to be using. Is it Matusevich or Kravitz or is it both? It's both. So... uh... Legally, it's Anna Matusevich Kravitz. Uh, Matusevich is my um, my maiden name. Kravitz is my married name. Although I'm, I have been divorced, but I kept the last name and I have not changed it. So, um, yeah. So I go by Anna Kravitz, Anya Kravitz, um, and it's an Eastern European name, Jewish name. So, and that's my background and heritage. Hmm. Well, I share the Ashkenazi lineage. <laughs> My, uh, my family came over, oh golly, in the 19 teens, somewhere through what I guess we're currently calling Ukraine, but who knows, during those times, the, uh, the maps kept changing a bunch. Um, yeah. Yeah, I tried to do a little ancestral research because my last name is Smith, which of course we know isn't original. Mm-hmm. Uh, best we were able to come up with is somebody at Ellis Island heard the original name and said, ah, no, you're Smith, you're on out. But the worst part is I can't find out what the original name was. The records just disappear right when I get to Ellis Island. Wow. (laughs) So if I, if I really wanted to go to the nth degree, I could probably hire somebody uh, in Europe to try to research this. But the problem is with the stuff going on in Ukraine right now, which is of course where you'd want to start the research. Yeah. I don't think that's happening. So I'll live with the mystery. Yeah. Yeah. But have you done your genetic lineage before? Like your, like knowing where you're like the full genetic lineage. Um, not the genetics necessarily, mm-hmm. but uh, like I did the ancestry thing. So, you know, yeah, I yeah. tapped into all those different databases and I was able to recreate the family tree. Uh, I was able to confirm, uh, at least one branch of the family ended up dying in Auschwitz. Um, so wow. that, that was startling news, but it was a distant branch, not anybody that, you know, today's family would have been in contact with but Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i mean i was able to trace it back but you know the the feathers disappear into the wind uh as you go further back in time because the record keeping just wasn't great right yeah no yeah it's um it's i i did ancestry too and um i saw that you know my my dad is jewish my mom is not and through ancestry, it said like I'm thirty. I'm like twenty five percent Finnish. Then bulk of it is Russian, and then they're almost thirty percent Jewish. Mm. Like like you know how they show like what regions you're in, and then like less than one percent um, Asian. But my family, which was really interesting, my mom is very my mom and her family, they have very prominent Mongolian features. Like you can even like, my eyes are like a little bit more slanted. Hmm. Um, and they're, they're smaller. Uh, but my mom on my mom's side of the family, it's very prominent. Like you, you know, they're very much Eurasian. 
And uh, I was so I was surprised to see not see like the Mongolian region be part of my ancestry somewhat, but like visually, facially, just even like the higher cheekbones. And yeah, I was going to say you've got the eyes eyes and the cheekbones. Uh, Yeah, you you don't know this, but I'll I'll tell you now. Uh, My wife is part Mongolian. And yeah, I'm I'm looking at your face. I'm like, I'm seeing her cheekbones and eyes. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I have you can hear it. See, like, yeah, my the, the higher cheekbones and the eyes, yeah. and so, and my mom is has even more prominent features, like more like this, her shape of the face, and then her a brother and sister, very, like, very much prominent. So anyway, I I love the whole, you know, ancestry genetics, like epigenetics, um, mm. and. And our connection, how that correlates to our connection to, you know, plant medicine, whether it's mushrooms, whether it's cannabis, whether it's like, you know, peyote, you know, we've, we've been traveling, we, we've been evolving with plant medicine, like through our entire, you know, human existence. Um, and we have receptors that react to this these plant medicines like plants talk to us and we talk to plants so which is some like a subject that i love to even go down the rabbit hole and so yeah well let's um, let, let's go there because this is this is what you do <laughs> so yeah we're, we're still so, kind of introducing you here on us so <laughs> yeah so um, i so i currently my 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 profession is i i currently work in cannabis industry in technology and um i am a i'm a i'm a consultant i'm a private consultant i have like a consultant agency and, and i kind of pick and choose what projects i work on and i love um i'm also going for my um uh, for my cannabis sommelier certification so i i i visited humboldt i've met some of the most incredible um people in the cannabis industry that have really built and, and, and really are the, the true warriors and pioneers of the plant. And, and even just going through the program, learning how, you know, just the origin of the plant and really understanding like a lot of the, just the genetics of the plant in different regions and how and what I already know about human genetics and putting these two together. It was just it's fascinating. Um, and um, and also part of what I do is I work with with mushrooms. I work with mushrooms and and cannabis uh, as healing and more of a, um, you know, wellness tool. Um, I help educate people on you know, their help guide them through experience, uh, but also integration post and post uh, experience and also preparing them for their experience, having it, making it very intentional. And really, really it's helping people get comfortable with self-awareness through plant medicine. I think that's the best way to describe um, partially what, what I do. So, um, and you know, my, my journey started with, with cannabis, um, and it kind of helped me open up my mind and and help me get more comfortable with mushrooms, but mushrooms really is like what really psilocybin has really since 2017 really is that, that pillar for me that I can, you know, I, I don't have any sort of like, whereas with cannabis, I could have maybe some adverse effect where, you know, I have to kind of watch my THC levels with, with mushrooms. It's a little bit different where, you know, um, I, I never experienced anxiety or anything like that, even through like larger doses. I always had like great experiences with cannabis. I mean, with, uh, mushrooms. Um, so yeah, the journey really started with cannabis and it led me to um, um, psilocybin mushrooms. And then my first guided experience was highly personalized. It was very, it was a hand holding experience. And, um, and it really changed, honestly changed my life. Like, I think that's the best way to describe it. And uh, it really made me 
want to understand the plant better and also pass on the gift of holding someone's hand through their first psilocybin experience and helping them with that self-awareness because it's so life-changing your your whole entire perception changes and you know in our modern day society a lot of people are not comfortable with self-reflection or looking at themselves in the mirror that self-awareness is a little bit scary for a lot of people um, because of our societal conditioning because of our uh, religious conditioning because of our cultural and ancestral conditioning this is all something that we carry on and this is something that we, people don't really realize is that you know you and I are of Jew Jewish heritage and this is in in us Jews we have specific genetic predispositions we have certain genes that have been passed on to us from generations and generations um, and you know, it builds up and it builds up in us. Um, and, you know, we have something that's called guilt, like, you know, we feel guilty. And, you know, when you do plant medicine, especially like, you know, a, a psilocybin experience, if you do a higher dose that, you know, exacerbates everything comes out. And a lot of people don't know how to deal with that. So, um, and yeah, that's what kind of started, helped me start in, um, in this, this, this guide journey, I would say. So, so you, you, you basically got your start on what is now your profession mm -hmm. based off of a personal experience. It was that Definitely. profound for you. Yes. Okay. That is a story I hear so often. And how do people like people that you've talked to, how do they integrate? Like after they've had that experience, you know, your perception changes, right? Mm. Like everything stays the same, but the way you view yourself and the way you view the world completely is different. So how do people integrate, like based on your experience and how have you integrated yourself? Sure, sure. So um, it's all over the board based on conversations I've had with folks. Uh, I've spoken with people who have gone and, you know, had a proper guided experience with a, an experienced shamanic type individual. Uh, I have also spoken to tons of people who just did the reckless, uh, drop something at a party, didn't really even know what they were doing. Uh, those stories typically end up bad. Uh, and then there are just the self explorers. I know lots of people who over time have had difficulty with their first trip and they didn't have somebody to talk to. And for whatever reason, they come talk to me. And I think it's because I have come sort of out of the closet, so to speak, and it gives folks license to come talk to me. So they do. Mm, but okay, integration, I, I, I find, is like one of the least things people talk about and yeah. one of the least things people pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely acknowledge it's important. It's yeah. not that everybody needs it and it's not that everybody needs it every time, but to know that it's available and to actually be able to avail yourself of it are critical, I, I think, for a lot of people, particularly in their new experiences. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, I think integration is something that's not, it hasn't been normalized yet. I think what's been normalized is like, take it and feel better. But people don't realize that there's, there's you know, so much more to it. Like I have people that, uh, constantly like now that I only do this by referral only so like I before I even engage with someone I have an extensive interview with them and want to understand their full entire wellness are they on medication and kind of understand what what do they want this medicine for right so um and you know what I find is that people people come to me and then they'll say like, oh, I heard it's really great for depression. I'm depressed. Like I'm just going through like, I'm, I'm depressed. I, I go through moodiness. I, and that's most, most people want some, like want it, want mush specifically psilocybin. Um, they, and, and cannabis too, although cannabis is like a little bit more complicated to kind of, um, to, to help with. Um, but with psilocybin, it's a little bit, e you know, I think it's a little bit more it's not as complex in, in my personal opinion, because you have your starter mushroom that is, you know, like a golden teacher that's really is very, very gentle. And you can start with that and really have a beautiful 
base camp experience. But really like, it's like I, they, people look at plant medicine as like a magic pill. I want to take it and Oh, I'm not going to be depressed anymore. But what people don't realize is that it's almost like you opening up a Pandora's box in some ways. Right. So like when you're taking in, in, a, in, you know, I always like warn people like your, your perception is going to change. Like there's things that you're going to look at life and yourself slightly in a slightly different way. And, you know, let's help prepare you. And most people that I talk to that I facilitate for, they don't understand that. And in some people are like, no, I'm going to be fine. Like until they actually go through the journey and then they say, oh, I know what you mean now by integration. I know, understand now what you yeah. mean. And then, only then. So it's still, we we have normalized plant medicine in, in, in a way of like, yeah, look at it as an alternative for like your depression or pharmaceuticals. But But what we haven't normalized and what we need to keep continuing the conversation is, is this is self work. Like this is work for, for yourself. And are you ready? Are you prepared to do the work? Because you're going to open up this box and you know, you'll take the plant medicine. You're whether you admit it or not, you're sensitive. You are sensitive to certain things and you can't operate the same way you operated yesterday before you took the medicine. And having that commitment to self is hard for people. And that's another thing that um, I like to help and, and start the conversation uh, with people is like, are you ready to, to start that like self-discovery journey, Com that commitment to yourself? Because if you really want to achieve that goal of, you know, I want to work on my relationship with myself. I want the plant medicine to help me like love myself more, or, you know, I want to understand why I'm depressed. I want to understand where I want to, I want this medicine to help me heal my traumas, but it's not boom, you take it, it's gone. It's just helps you understand where it's coming from and it'll give you insights on how to fix it. How only you are in charge of your own self. No one is here to, to, no one is here to fix you except self, but plant medicine helps you reconnect with yourself in that way and helps you s get clarity in, in many ways with self. So yeah. this, this is the critical part of, of messaging the, the psychedelic renaissance right now, because I, I completely agree with you. And I, I think the problem at its core is that in, in Western civilization, we look at medicine with the expectation that I'm just going to take a pill and go about my day. And there's nothing for me to do other than swallow the pill. The pill is going to do all the work for me. I don't have to do any of the work, any of the thinking. And that's simply wrong when it comes to psychedelics. Uh, I think they facilitate an opportunity for you to get to know yourself better, but you have to be willing to then walk through that door. Yeah, exactly. Make that commitment to yourself. Yeah. Uh, but then there's people that are like, you know what? I don't care. Like, I just want to have a good time. And there's a lot like I also get those people, too. Mm -hmm. I just want to have a good time. And that's great. But a good time, um, you know, like like what is a good time? I don't know. I've never really I guess. Have I had a good time on <laughs> on a mushroom? Like, what is a good time? <laughs> Yeah. I, uh, Wouldn't you know, that be terribly I, subjective, though? I mean, one totally, person's good totally time could be another person's yeah. nightmare. Right? I actually have a friend who is um, who's who's also an, an attorney in cannabis and um, on the East Coast. And uh, he doesn't care about like getting in touch with himself. He wants to have a good time. And no matter which way I like slice it and dice it it's like he, he's already taken mushrooms at a concert and he's like yeah i had a great time but then i think about it i'm like mm, yeah maybe he 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 i don't know i i've never really taken mushrooms in like a busy busy place like that i feel like it would freak me out maybe in some ways i mm. don't know but um but yeah i don't know what a good time is for me a good time like also is maybe um laughing M mushrooms make me laugh a lot they 
They make me cry. They make me very in tune and sensitive to what, 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 wherever I am, I'm just a little bit more in tune with that environment. You know, you know what's important, though, just to, to knock the propaganda down? I'm willing to bet the mushrooms don't make you homicidal. I bet they don't make you feel like you want to go jump off a building or try to eat your own head, right? Although it can, because they can. <laughs> they can. They really can. Honestly, like okay. I'll say this. I do know a few people that who, if you take, if you're just kind of like, you know, you, you take too much, it'll activate your psychosis. If you have a predisposition oh, to psychosis. Okay, but you're showing up to the game already having a problem. The mushrooms but, are simply... But most, people, but most people don't know. Like, So here's another sure. thing. Yeah. Most people don't even know that they have like a psychosis trait. They might be like, for women, it could be like, oh, I'm just moody or I'm hormonal. But it could be actually like your psychosis trait is like triggering. Um, and for men, it's the same thing. Like it's, we are walking around like... I feel like human beings today, humans today, we're walking around like psychotic, stressed out, and really like at the end of our rope. Like you see it in like, I live in LA, like truly it's, you know, road rage is like, is beyond. I've never seen road rage like this in my life. Like Mm -hmm. people are just angry. People are yelling at each other. They're angry. They like there's hit and runs like people don't val. We don't value each other. Like people don't value people. We, we, yeah, we don't have any value for our, for human life, which is so crazy and wild um, to me, but it's evident in society like currently. So, oh, yeah, yeah. But I, I, don't, I don't think it's new, <laughs> though. I think it trends. I think it, it ebbs and flows and it cycles. I think there's um, something like a national mental health level. I don't know what the metric would be to measure it, but I am confident if, if some mental health types wanted to study this, they probably could and probably put some metrics to it and measure that, you know, as current events and news changes, the tension in the country ratchets up or ratchets down. Uh, I think I think so, Yeah. It's the problem with psychedelics, unless you've had the experience, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's really no able metaphor I can offer you that's going to adequately describe what I'm trying to tell you, because you have no baseline by which to compare it to. So that's, you know, that's, that's the difficulty when talking to outsiders about this is until you've had it, you you just, you're not going to get it entirely. Um, you know, I, I describe this like you're trying to explain the color red to somebody who's never had use of their eyes. You can do a lot to describe red, but are they ever really going to get it? Not really. Yeah, no, totally agree. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, for me, I've never tried peyote before, uh, but everything that you're describing um and I've come close to trying peyote a couple of times. I just haven't had the opportunity, but I've had those experiences on, on psilocybin where I felt the oneness, like, and I felt the oneness with like, even at the time with people that I was, you know, having the mushroom medicine with, uh, like, I really felt like I was telepathically connected to them and like communicating with them. And, you know, um, a few experiences I've had with mushrooms where, yeah, I, I felt, um, I felt like I've seen my soul family. Like another thing that I'm really into that I've been into for almost 10 years is like past life regression mm. therapy. So like past life regression is something that's helped me a lot in, I didn't go the traditional therapy route because I understood that like my journey to self-discovery started in my early thirties. Um, so about 20, about 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, and I started with, um, with, I didn't, I didn't go to the plant medicine route. I went strictly to the past life regression therapy route because some, some of the decisions that I was making in my, you know, in my late twenties, early thirties, I, wanted to get to the core of it but I'm not like a huge traditional therapy like believer so and then through past life regression it kind of helped me it it helped me understand plant medicine a lot more 
like I don't know if it makes sense, but it's but you kind of you see yourself outside of your body. You understand that you are a soul being. You are a traveling soul. You have you know your avatar, and you've you know you've made decisions, certain decisions based on like your your past experiences. And sometimes you don't understand why you're making those decisions. But then when you go deeper, you understand that they're coming from something deeper than, than this lifetime. They're coming deep. They're coming more from like an uh, something else. And that's why also like, I love that con like the, I love talking about epigenetics because it really goes hand in hand with like past life regression therapy. Mm. And, um, and, yeah, with, with plant medicine, with, with mushrooms specifically with cannabis, I've never had those like mind altering, like experiences where I'm like, so connected to the other person. It's more with cannabis for me, it's more an overall wellness plant. Um, and it helps me with many different things, but with mushrooms, it's definitely, I can, I can connect to the other realm, like the, the other world that, that that's where I am. Yeah. And, you know, you know, through past life regression, I understood what soul family was because I, I saw my soul family through different lifetimes. Um, and with mushrooms, they just kind of like helped me get to that that place again i don't know if like that no i i'm i'm absolutely understanding what you're okay, saying yeah. but this is my comment if you have not had these experiences I, I suspect listeners who haven't had these experiences will not have a clue what you're trying to describe yeah. right now but but honestly it doesn't even and, and that's the thing like um it's it doesn't have to you could start with if you are kind of like thinking about plant medicine and you're like oh i'm a little afraid or i am you know, I have, you know, I have a job that doesn't allow me to, there's a lot of jobs like government jobs or like, you know, uh, other professions that, you know, they do drug testing all the time and people are afraid they don't mm -hmm. want to, but, but they do see the benefits for themselves. And maybe I feel like past life regression therapy could be a good start to like understanding yourself outside of your own body. Um, and if someone it just if anyone is interested in this type of topic, there's a, um, a an amazing there's a, the oldest book called like um, many lives, many masters. That's like it changed my life. My sister gave me that book um, at 30 when I turned 30. And um, it's by Brian, Dr. Brian Weiss. He's been like on Oprah and then he wrote like a ton of other books. But um, but if anyone is interested, it's a good way to kind of get introduced introduced into the world of, of beyond your current life and beyond your physical self without taking mind altering substances and down the line, you know, um, it introduce slowly introduce or a, a cannabis or, or mushrooms or ketamine, there's clinics. And that, and that goes back to the conversation you and I had earlier is like, what is the future of, of, plant psychedelics looks like in the next mm. like five to 10 years. And, um, I really, as I, I was just at a, at a conference in Miami for psychedelics, I was just, you know, it's also like part of my world here in cannabis and psychedelics, which, especially which conference Benzinga. Oh yeah. Yeah. I saw that advertised. I was, mm -hmm. um, I was there in December, I think for the, uh, Canadella conference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually Miami is like becoming a hot spot for these like psychedelic. Oh conferences, my which is god! Crazy. Yeah, no, Miami is uh, hats off to them. They are grabbing psychedelics with both hands and pulling it in, and I think it's because of the airport. I, I know that so, I know that sounds what? weird, but here's the thing: it's an international hub, and a lot of traffic from Central and South America comes through there, which means direct line to Peru and Colombia and all the places where a lot of these plant medicines come from. And mm. I, I think, you know, a lot of the culture is in the Miami region also because of that. So I think that's why 
uh, Miami's taking control, <laughs> so to speak. You would have thought like Berkeley, but no, I think it's Miami. Yeah. Yeah, I would think like maybe L.A. or mm-hmm. cause like, you know, we have a lot of, you know, you, you have the desert, you have the hippies, you have like, you know, uh, just California itself is just like very psychedelic and very friendly with plant medicine. But yeah, mm-hmm. Miami is like a little shocking. But anyway, it's like it's interesting what's going to happen. But it's definitely I, I personally don't see it being um, introduced in a commercial way like cannabis is. Uh, not in the, I don't think in the next like 10 years, I feel like it's going to be regulated in a way where you kind of like ketamine, you have to go to a clinic, Mm. have your session and then leave. Although here where I live in certain, in certain stores, you can buy, you can actually go and buy psilocybin, um, in some CBD stores. Like you can buy psilocybin, um, you can buy psilocybin on Instagram. Like you can buy it from people, but it's again, it's like, do you want to for your first time? Like you know, and not knowing where it's coming from, not knowing where your medicine is coming from, and then mm-hmm. kind of doing it. It's best to do it through a guide or through knowing where, you know, where were your mushrooms grown? Like. Um, you know, what kind of person grew them because also they, they absorb a lot of energy. So having a mindful grower who is really creating a a positive environment for the mushroom that you're about the medicine that you're growing, that's that you're about to consume that I feel like that also matters a lot. Oh, source, Um, source and safety. Absolutely. Think of it this way. If you were just walking down the sidewalk and as you're walking, you spot a sandwich just sitting on the sidewalk. Would you eat that sandwich? Of course not. <laughs> Nobody would. <laughs> well, oh, so yeah, the there are a few people, people, people who would. <laughs> but yeah, you know, if you're not willing to eat that sandwich, why would you take something from a stranger? Right. But people do. People mm-hmm. do. And that's the thing. Like, that's the thing is, 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 you know, if you are going to have your, especially psilocybin now, like, you don't even like, I'm sure you get those, the phone calls as well. Like I get people asking me all the time. Oh, I want some mushrooms. Send me some mushrooms. Send me some mushrooms. Send me some mushrooms. Send me some microdose pills. I mean, and it's like, how are you going to take it? Who are you? What are you like? What is your intention? And, and just to make it a positive experience and, and harm reduction too. Like, you know, um, well, you could, being the lawyer on the call, I'll also say yeah. the risk is horrendous because, you know, look, psilocybin is still completely illegal everywhere. Um, so, yeah, it's a huge risk. And people, I think, are a tad cavalier at times about it. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, but, I, I mean, I'd like to hear your opinion, like, to where do you feel, um, you know, how do you feel the industry of this plant medicine is going to, where do you feel it's going? Like, mm. there's so much, there's a overabundance of information there's an overabundance of you know even your your grandmother's asking for it Mm -hmm. cannabis and mushrooms so yeah how do you feel what do you think is how do you think it's gonna go sure so i actually do have some thoughts on this uh we know that there are several psychedelic substances that are are making their way through the licit pathways provided by the FDA and the DEA. And within like the next two to four years, you're going to see several of these substances available through through proper pharmaceutical channels. Uh, this includes uh, iterations of psilocybin and also iterations of MDMA and possibly some others. Uh, I've seen uh, several articles in the last year talking about different formulations, oddly enough, one for LSD that they're claiming has no psychedelic trip effect, but like everything else. Uh, so yeah, you're going to see these substances coming up again, I think in the next two to four years, my supposition, I don't know this for a fact, but it just seems proper that what FDA is going to say is these are going to be clinic use only. So you're not going to be able to like go to your doctor, get a script for psilocybin and pop down to your pharmacy and have your pharmacist hand you a bunch of mushrooms and send you home. I don't think that's going to happen. I think instead you're going to have to go to a clinic, have them issued to you at a clinic, take them at a clinic, be monitored while you're on them at a clinic. And then whenever the clinic decides you're back at a reasonable baseline that you could drive home, they'll let you drive home. 
Uh, and that means that those visits are going to be hellaciously expensive. I think health insurance is going to be slow to accept it. And even mm-hmm. when they do, it's still going to be hellaciously expensive. And it's because of all the human components tied to it. You know, if you have to have this substance in a clinic only, well, now the price tag for the, the patient or the customer includes the rent on that facility because they're going to have to pay some portion of it, the mandatory doctor who's going to be on staff, and that person's going to have a high salary. That's got to be paid for. All the other people who work at the clinic, the insurance the clinic needs, the advertising the clinic uses, the phones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I think it's going to be very expensive. And resultingly, this very important class of m- drugs that are going to really revolutionize mental health and mental health treatment in this country are going to be inaccessible to most people. Mm-hmm. We're, we're creating an economic class system in psychedelics by following the FDA path. I'm not opposed to the FDA path. I think it's a fine thing. I think there are a lot of folks who want that. They need that. It's just what they appreciate. Yeah, you know, like I look at my parents. They, they want a doctor in a white lab coat with a stethoscope. They don't want a shaman with a feather. Uh, you may get identical experience from both, but, you know, they don't want the shaman. They want the guy in the white coat. Fine. You should have that if that's what makes you comfortable. I have no quarrel with that. But a chunk of the population is either not going to be able to afford that or won't want to interact with it. And why should either of those groups be excluded? So I think as these licit substances come into the fore and reach prominence, they will cause a blossoming in the grassroots for people who can't afford it or just don't want to go to a doctor. So this is coming. I think it's already started. The fact that you and I are here on this podcast today talking about it, I think is proof positive of that. So what I've been busy working on, uh, I am a member now of the Psychedelic Bar Association, and I'm also a committee steward for the Law and Regulatory Committee. And we're talking about crafting a model act that would allow for regulation at the grassroots level outside of FDA. And much like what we're seeing with Oregon, or you could use all the different cannabis programs around the country, not a one of them are FDA-approved programs, right? They're just state Mm -hmm. laws that changed. And yeah, they are in direct conflict with the federal law, but there they are nonetheless. So I think we'll see some iteration of that for other plant medicines. The trick is to create a program that can work, I think, nationally would be the ideal Uh, and also to prevent a lot of the mistakes that happen in cannabis. I think cannabis over-industrialized. I think it took too much focus on profits and lost all focus on the plant. And I hope we can prevent that from happening to these other substances because it's proper to treat them differently because they are different. Yeah, no, you're you're so on point. You know, in September, I'm getting ready to actually have like a proper certification. I've taken, I've been working with psilocybin since 2017 and I've, I have done like trainings on, on, um, on facilitating, uh, experiences and I'm getting ready to, uh, enter a different certification program. It's a six month program. It's through a center called sound mind, um, in Philadelphia and they're connected to maps and so they are they're encouraging like this um it's it's a certified program it's like pretty legit i I, some of the people that i know that are deep into psychedelics or you know they they've taken this program or they're in currently in this program to go not be underground but have more of a a a authoritative voice and and have like some, you know, certification behind it and anybody can do it. You don't have to be a doctor, although there's doctors and therapists that are like physical therapists that are doing it. So there's a lot of people from the medical industry and it's going to be, it's interesting. Like, you know, I'm going to get this certification, right? So, and then what, like, you know, is it, it's, it's still federally, you know, it's still going to be interesting to see, like, let's say, like, if I wanted to do this, like, completely full time and leave my, you know, the cannabis side, for example, not that I will, but let's say I only want to focus on facilitating, like, 
where even would I, there's not that many centers that are open for something like this. There's not that many places that somebody can go and they are actually really expensive. There's like, there's some companies that I've seen online where they're charging like three and a half thousand dollars for a facilitator, not a nurse, not like somebody like me, like Mm -hmm. it would be like someone like me and not providing the mushrooms. You're just basically sitting there with someone when they bring their own mushrooms and you are, you're, you're charging, you know, you're charging three and a half thousand dollars. Yeah. And that's like, most people cannot afford it. So they go underground. They ask like, do you know someone that can do this for me? Or they ask their friends to your point. Exactly. It's already happening. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be wildly unbalanced and still, I think feel people will prefer to go underground, um, and use the underground sources to, help facilitate and guide them um because yeah to your point it's wildly it's already wildly expensive one of the people that was actually that came to me she looked at that specific um service before she came to me and uh, that's how i know of it i asked her to send it to me i read through it and i was i I was shocked at how much they were charging without even bringing them providing the medicine or providing anything oh, more yeah. than just sitting. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not shocked at anything I see. And, I, and I'm not casting aspersions at any individual or group here, but the reality is there are as many charlatans out there as there are legitimate people. And the consuming public has trouble sometimes distinguishing them. So part of what I hope (laughs) we can do with this uh, model act that I'm talking about is to create some level of credentialing, but not have it be insane because you're right. It doesn't need a PhD type in every seat. It maybe doesn't even need a PhD type in any seat. You know, uh, plant medicine came up through a shamanic oral tradition and multiple cultures over multiple thousands of years handled it just fine without having some dude in a lab coat and a fancy degree. So we shouldn't be wedded to the notion that if it isn't from a proper Johns Hopkins doctor, it's not real. That's simply not true. My opinion. No, definitely. Um, So yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting topic. And you know, what I want to kind of like, I know we're kind of like coming up to the end, but what I'd love to leave people with um, your audience, whoever is listening out there, um, is, you know, if you do want to start with this plant medicine journey and you're really interested, um, you know, figure out your purpose first, you know, um, talk to, you know, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to, you know, you, uh, many, Gary many Smith, people do <laughs> many people. Yeah. And then find somebody that is actually going to hold your hand through this process one-on-one and make it as purposeful as possible with a trusted guide that's going to help you get ready for this journey mentally mentally and physically prepare you because it does take a physical toll and making sure that you are your mindset is ready um and then help you with that post uh post experience um i'll leave my my email i'll leave my email address on here it's anya.kravitz a-n ya.cravitz at gmail.com. I'm also on Instagram. Um, I've had like so many different problems with my social lately. I got hacked and through my Facebook is also hacked. It's such a big problem. By the way, uh, warning for like your, your listeners, if you are like on social media and you're seeing people selling certain psilocybin products, do not click and do not buy from, from Instagram or Um, or anything like that, because this is psilocybin and cannabis and like other psychedelic substances that are being kind of like talk pushed on, on social is most likely it's all a scam. It's all like a scam. So, but anyway, my, my handle for social is for Instagram is my, um, I'm actually going to pull it up right now. I don't always remember it. (laughs) Um, but it's Anya, Aina, Aina Collective. So it's at A Y N A Collective with a K, K O L L E C T I V E. 
So uh, feel free to reach out if you need, if you just want to talk about it or just need some help or just even explore. Even on the topic of past life regression, I'm here. I'm here as like a source, a guide, a friend. Excellent. Excellent. By the way, I can absolutely respect the, uh, the not keeping the social media handle straight. <laughs> I, uh, I, I have a, a, by necessity, a Twitter account and I tried to get psychedelic Alex because it made sense. Uh, but apparently somebody named psychedelic Alex took it already. So on, mm. on Twitter, I'm Lex psychedelica. Yeah. So I have to find this Alex guy and wrestle the damn name back. <laughs> <laughs> and what makes you well, psychedelic, Alex? Well, you know what? You're an attorney. Why don't you like squeeze that legal muscle oh, a little bit? <laughs> I never use my powers for evil, Anna. Mm, Only for but good. But it's not for evil. It's not for evil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Is there any other final thoughts before we break? Um, no, I think, uh, I think we've covered it. Um, thank you again for this platform and oh, thank you again for what you're doing, you know, for yourself and for your com immediate community and any, every little bit of information helps. Um, so be open, stay kind to each other, love each other and respect each other and respect, respect plants, plant medicine. So that's the only thing I'd like to leave you and the audience with so you got final word i can't improve on that thanks so much <laughs> thank you take care take bye care. one love have a question about psychedelics and the law you're welcome to submit them please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community. Thank you.